Welcome to our presentation on the Edmund Carp MaxFlow algorithm. Before we discuss how it works, it's important to mention what it is used for. The algorithm calculates how to obtain the maximum throughput from a flow network. There are many applications to this. For example, computer networks, how data is routed through the internet. Traffic control, how cars are routed through rows. Even water through sewers or other problems such as bipartite matching can be reduced to a form solvable by this algorithm. This is an example of a network made up of edges and vertices. In the example of a city, the edges could be roads and the vertices could be cities. The first stage of our algorithm is to find the shortest path from the source to the sink. There are multiple ways of doing this, which we'll get into later. However, our algorithm, the edmunds carp algorithm, uses a breadth-first search approach, which we'll explain now. During the runtime of the algorithm, we're going to be keeping track of the paths that we have currently got to from the source to our destination. The first stage of this is simply to add the root node to our collection of paths. Now that the root node has been added to our collection of paths, we have to inspect the children connected to it. In this example, the two children nodes are 1 and 3. So we note that and then update our collection of paths so that we now have s to 1 and s to 3. Now we need to inspect the children of the ends of the paths that we currently have. So. The children of 1 is 2 and 3, and the children of 3 is just 4. OK, so now we need to update our paths again. S, S to 1 can also go to 2, or it can go to 3. So we need to note that and make them two separate paths in our collection of paths. Meanwhile, S to 3 can only go to 4. And now finally, we just need to check the children of the paths that we currently have. So from 2, we can get to the sink straight away. So congratulations, the algorithm has terminated. Now that we've finally found a node that connects to the sink, we can go back and update our paths accordingly so that we have a path from source to sink. The shortest path has been found. Now we'll discuss the rest of the algorithm. The first step is to select the path with the minimum edges, which is done by the process just shown. The next step is to calculate the maximum flow for this path. This is done by finding the edge with the minimum value. In this case, the edge with the minimum value is 15. Now we need to update the residual graph. S to 1 is reduced from 22 to 7, 1 to 2 from 20 to 5, and 2 to the sink goes from 15 to 0. Now we need to add return edges. These are edges flowing in the opposite direction for the amount that we previously calculated. I like to think of these edges as a way of saying we have pushed 15 that way, but we can decide to bring it back if we choose to. Now that we've allocated 15 to flow down this path from the source to the sink, we can add 15 to the total. Notice the edge between 2 and the sink is now 0. It will be ignored in the next iterations as it has already got the maximum flow flowing down it. Some implementations choose to remove it, but for clarity we're going to leave it there as a placeholder. Now we start the whole process again by selecting a new path with the minimum edges. The breadth first search has chosen this one highlighted on the bottom. Now we need to calculate the maximum flow for this path which as you remember from before is the minimum of all the edges, in this case 4. Now we update the residual graph by reducing the flows by 4 and then add return edges for 4 back along the same path. Now as we have allocated 4 to flow from the source to the sink we can increase the total flow by 4. Now we go back to the beginning and select the next path with the minimum number of edges. This is the path we have chosen. We now calculate the maximum flow of this path, which is 7. Now we need to update the residual graph by reducing the flows, and then add the return edges. Now as we have another 7 flowing from the source to the sink, we can add 7 to the total flow. 
As all edges from the source are maxed out, the algorithm terminates with a total flow of 26. Like we mentioned before, there are two algorithms we can use to select the path in our max flow problem. The first which we've already explained is a breadth first search. This means it's an Edmund Carp algorithm. However, if we use a depth first search, it becomes a Ford Fulkerson algorithm. There's a disadvantage to the depth first search algorithm in that it's no longer guaranteed to terminate. We'll explain this in further detail. Now we're going to solve our max flow problem on this example simplistic network using depth first search and we're going to highlight why the Edmund Scarp algorithm is truly the superior method. Again we're going to select the path of source to sync but now notice it's an arbitrary path not the shortest path like before. Now we're going to calculate the maximum flow of our selected path and then update the residual graph with the new capacities and of course add the return edges of 1. Now that's all done for that path and now all we need to do is update the total flow and again select another arbitrary path and now we need to calculate the max flow for this path which also happens to be 1 again. Now we need to reduce the flows of our selected path and now update the return edges and now update the total flow to 2. Continuing onwards, uh, we select yet another arbitrary path. The algorithm could just happen to select the same one as before, that's completely fine because it's still a valid path. Calculate the max flow of that path, we've got 1 again. And update the residual flows, now we've gone from 100 to 98. And of course, update the return edges to 2. Now, again, add 1 to the total flow. Now we're going to start the process again, setting another arbitrary path. Now we're going to calculate the max flow of that path. And update the residual graph with the reduced flows. Add the return edges, updating them all to 2. And now update the total flow to 4. Again, setting an arbitrary path. Again, calculate the max flow for this path. Update the residual flows, add the return edges, and update the total flow to 5. Now you can probably uh, notice a pattern now. Um, it's very slowly iterating through the algorithm, taking one off the path at each stage. Now it's going to eventually get to the correct answer of a max flow of 200. However, if we use the Edmund Karp algorithm, it would just select the top path S to 1 to T and we'd finish the algorithm a lot quicker. This is a major downfall of the ford Ferguson algorithm. Now to finish, let's talk quickly about the time complexity of these algorithms. ford Ferguson is of the order Ke, where K is maximum flow and E are the edges. This algorithm depends on the flow because as you have seen, it can keep iterating all the way from zero all the way up to the maximum flow. It is this problem that can make it slightly inefficient. The proof of the complexity of the Edmund Karp algorithm is too complicated to cover in this video, so we will just outline it basically. First we can show that all vertices in the residual graph increase monotonically. Then we can also show that the total number of iterations is of the order VE, where V is vertices and E is edges. If each iteration is of order E, then the total runtime is order V E squared. Thanks for watching this presentation on the Edmunds-Karp algorithm by Steve Thompson and Greg Cawthorn.